Welcome back to Let's Play The Adams Family. Last time around we headed inside the crypt, defeated the ghastly goblin and rescued Wednesday. And today we're going to save our second Adams Family member. But first, I have a small confession to make. Do you remember when I said that I had shown off all the secrets at the end of the first video that both the mansion and its surrounding areas had to offer? Well, I was lying. There's actually a hidden doorway that takes you to Pugsley's Den with three extra lives to collect, plus a set of training shoes and a heart refill. Useful stuff. And by the way, all these road signs that are dotted around have actually been stolen by Pugsley. It's one of his little quirks in both the TV show and the cartoon. But that's not the end of the secrets. Oh no. Press up again on this particular stop sign and you'll be taken to a super secret area with, as you can see, quite a lot of money. Just Lying around. Quite why Pugsley has a load of money in his den, I have no idea. The guy's like 10. No 10 year old should have that amount of dollars in their room. But I digress. The main feature of this super secret area are these doors. Behind each of these doors is a power up room of some description. But some of the rooms are more useful than others. Take this one for example, the ingeniously titled Take Heart. So called because it's nothing but heart refills. I'm sure the Ocean team were patting themselves on the back for that one. But here's the thing. Gomez can only have five hearts in his life bar maximum at any one time. So really, the only remote possible purpose this room would serve would be to max out your points. And to be honest, that's both a futile and pointless activity. The second room is quite a bit more useful then. It's the sports hall. There is, again, quite a lot of money just laying around. This is kind of a trend with most bonus areas in this game. Not all, but most bonus areas will have at least some money just lying around. We also have uh, what gives the sports hall its name. We have access to the rapier and the golf ball. And also, not at all hidden in the middle there, another extra life. Skipping ahead to the third room then. It's the cloak room, and as you can see, it just has a bit more money. But... As you can see, this room also has a second tier to it that we can't quite reach. Gomez, as you can see, just can't jump quite high enough to stand on that ledge. I'll come back and deal with that in a second, and I'm going to skip this door as well just for the moment to show you what's in the fifth door. Because what is in this fifth door is about as useful as a chocolate teapot. We have a set of training shoes, but they're too high for Gomez to collect them. What was the point of this? Is there any point to this? I don't think so. Other than to show that white men can't jump, and neither apparently can members of the Adams family. Well, actually, that's kind of a, a slanderous lie. I mean, Gomez is jumping quite well there. He just can't jump high enough to get those stupidly placed training shoes. Whatever, I digress. Let's go back to the fourth room that I skipped then. It's the hat room. Now, this gap can be jumped over without the training shoes, but it's so much easier when you have the training shoes equipped. All that's in the hat room is a hat, specifically the Fezcopter, but we need this Fezcopter to access the best secrets of this area. Go back to the cloak room, fly like the wind bullseye, and as you can see, we can finally reach the mysterious upper tier. And our reward for reaching the mysterious upper tier is... No fewer and no more than 19 extra lives. Yes, I counted them all, and that's sad. They're going to come in mighty handy later on in the game, let me tell you. Anyway, that completes the secret items collector form, so let's head back to the Hall of Stairs, shall we? So our next destination, then, is right at the top of the Hall of Stairs here. Inside this door, we have our second dungeon, the Games Room. And I'm calling it the second dungeon because, for me, of course, it is the second dungeon, but it wouldn't necessarily be for you guys in your respective games. Non-linearity, blah de blah de blah in fact, a lot of gamers choose to do uh, the games room first and then go and save Wednesday in the crypt. Presumably for time-saving purposes. I won't be doing that because I have my own reasons that I'm not going to get into right now for doing it in this certain order. So the games room then, which is quite an ironic title, because this is about as far removed from fun and games as I think you could possibly get. We have all manner of implements of death, doom and destruction out to kill us at every turn. And in no particular order of deadliness, we have dropping guillotine blades, swinging balls and chains, rotating axes coming up from the floor. Uh, those annoying green hoodies that spit axes directly into your face, spikes all over the floor, cannon fire, 
and a bit later on we'll have exploding bombs to avoid as well. In short, not a pleasant collection of hazards. And yet, I quite like this place. It's roughly the same amount of difficulty as uh, the crypt was to complete, and it's roughly the same amount of length as well, which might be why a lot of gamers choose to do it first. And now we come to a recurring secret room gimmick. Anytime you see a wooden door such as this one in the games room, you want to jump on top of the frame and see if you can press up to open a secret door and go to a secret area, because 9 times out of 10 you can do. In this secret area, the toy box, it seems we can't reach the items that are below us here. Except of course we can or they wouldn't be there in the first place. Jump on this door frame, jump up through this false ceiling, drop down here, and you can collect the golf ball, two heart refills, and an extra life. Useful stuff. And by the way, you can also drop down the right hand side here, it makes no difference really, it gives you that same amount of bonus points. Now I could take this door over to the right here, but it's actually a shortcut and I'll skip a couple of rooms, and I'm not going to do that because I'm trying to show off everything this game has to offer. Which is a lot! Now this area, the Toy Tower, appears to be just one of those basic transitional rooms we've seen quite a few of so far throughout the game. And broadly speaking, yes it is, but it also has a much higher purpose than that. I'm not going to elaborate on that too much right now, but suffice to say that's not the last time we'll see that room. So we're now in an area that's one boom away from being a terrible Venga Boys hit of the 1990s, and we have the return of some familiar foes. The green goose step or walk like an Egyptian guys from the first video, and also there was some hiding around in the crypt. Now you might remember that I asked uh, people in the comments of the, of the first video to come up with a better name than green walk like an Egyptian guys for those enemies. And Pale Voyager won the carrot. Say hello to the Nazi Gumbies. Presumably because they look like Gumby, and they goose step everywhere like Nazis. Smooth, Pale. Smooth. But the Nazi Gumbies are by no means the most annoying enemy in this area of the game. That dubious award goes to the green hooded dude shooting axes out of their mouth at you. And the reason for this, much like Easy Origami, is twofold. Firstly, even after you've killed them, their axes will still boom around back to them, and there's a very strong possibility they will hit you. So they can still kill you even when they're off the screen themselves. And secondly, Ocean was sneaky bastards when it came to placing these enemies, and then usually position them in areas where you need to make very precise jumps in order to escape unscathed. I'm not saying this is a bad thing because I usually applaud game companies when they increase the difficulty of games without making things unfair, but they're still annoying. And here we have a bonus room, ingeniously titled The Bonus Room, perhaps the most unimaginative title in the entire game, and it's a huge disappointment. Firstly because there's only $10 to collect, which is hardly worth the effort to get here, and secondly, to add insult to injury, the journey back from the bonus room is far more hazardous than the journey getting to the bonus room. Presumably because of the placement of the hazards. Well, I say presumably, it is because of the placement of the hazards. But if you're fortunate and a little lucky, which is exactly the same thing, but never mind, let's go with it, you can escape unscathed. Now we're back in the toy tower, or to be more precise, we're back in a toy tower. Because you'll notice, this has got the exact same name as that other area I talked about. And now it's time to solve the mystery of the toy tower. Press down here, and you'll shimmy down a rope, and you'll be taken to the toy tower we were in a couple of minutes ago. And that's the major purpose of these rooms, to act as shortcuts. And they're pretty good shortcuts too, because usually this area of the mansion takes roughly 10 minutes to complete if you're playing through it well. Using all the shortcuts provided to you, you could do it in under half the time. And Ocean have been sneaky bastards again here, because usually the secret area will be placed at the end of the room. Here, they placed it right at the beginning of the room. Just to throw you off the scent. And to make matters worse, this is a bonus area you really want to find, and on my first playthrough I had no idea this existed, because there are two extra lives and it's not that hard to reach them, unlike in certain other areas that we're going to come to in a minute. Now, avid fans of the Adams Family will be recognizing the face on those, on, that, uh, on those ball and chains. It's quite a familiar face. In fact, it's the face of the character that we're going to save. Now interestingly, there was no thing hint box at the very start of this area to tell you who it was we're about to rescue. This is the only area in the game, to my knowledge, apart from the final one, or certainly the last dungeon of the game, which does this, so I'm just going to have to tell you who it is. That is the face of Pugsley, of course, Morticia and Gomez's overweight son. 
I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Pugsley in a minute, but first we have some more gameplay related issues to take care of. First of all, the cannibal explosions cannot harm Gomez, which is handy. And secondly, this is what I mean about the placement of these uh, green guys. You see what I mean? It, it, it's kind of hard, especially on your first playthrough, to uh, avoid getting hit by an axe, but nowhere near compared to that one. Would you have any idea on your first playthrough that that was coming for you? Of course not. And these ball and chains may not seem like too tough a hazard right now, but these are quite slow compared to others that we're going to see later on. Right now, they're quite tame. Later on, you'll think they're on crack. And as you can see, there is no secret room here at the end of the Conquer Cage, just to prove to you that I was right, and that Ocean are indeed sneaky bastards. We have another toy tower here. They're built in pairs. And this is the trickiest toy tower of all to navigate. You have to do these things in a very specific order. First, they kill that guy as soon as the app retracts back into his mouth. And then my advice to you is to ignore the cash for the, for the, uh, for the meantime, then bounce up, then kill the green hooded dude, and then you can go on a spending spree and collect your money. That's the best way to get through this room. So let's talk a little bit about Pugsley then. Now I would love to tell you that his full name was Pugsley, Sat Pugsley Saturday Adams. Unfortunately, I can't. Because I just made it up. His actual middle name is never revealed, although in Charles Adams' uh, handwritten notes for the 1960s TV series, uh, actually for the 1950s comic strip, his middle name is listed as perhaps being Pubert. And the interesting thing about the name Pubert, it was originally going to be Posley's name in the 1960s TV series until Charles Adams came to his senses and realised that it sounded a little too much like the word puberty. So he changed it to Pugsley, which in my opinion is a far, far better name. And also Pubert, for those that have seen the second film, The Adams, Adams Family Values, uh, they'll know that Pubert is the name of the baby that Wednesday and Pugsley try and kill throughout the movie. So let's talk a little bit about Pugsley then. He was played by Ken Weatherwax in the 60s TV series and by Jimmy Workman in the two movies I've just mentioned. And the interesting thing about Pugsley, he's probably the Adams Family member whose character has changed the most throughout the series. In the 60s, he's, he's actually portrayed as the elder sibling between him and Wednesday. Wednesday is the younger sister, whereas now she's seen as the, 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 um, the older sibling. I believe he was aged around 10 in the, uh, in the 60s TV series, but don't quote me on that. Whereas now it's Wednesday that's 10 and Pugsley's about 6 or 8. He was a genius in his own right because he loved inventing things. However, fast forward to the 90s and the two movies and the subsequent cartoon series, and Pugsley's character does a complete 180. He's no longer shy and timid. He now cares more about eating food than inventing things. In fact, he can polish, he usually polishes off at least five slices of birthday cake whenever the Adams family have a birthday bash. Now in the first movie, his role was trying to survive the many plots and attempts of his life by his sister Wednesday. And by the way, I have some unfinished business. That is damn satisfying. Uh, so, the plots by his sister Wednesday trying to kill him, but he appears to be uh, at least semi-invulnerable because they never work. Either that or Wednesday's just rubbish at killing people, which I'm inclined not to believe. In the second movie, however, he and Wednesday declare a truce and instead decide to try and kill off little baby Pubert. This is due to a case of extreme sibling rivalry. And believe it or not, we're actually towards the we're actually getting towards the end of the game's room, but not before the game does what it usually does with these big dungeons and throws most of the hazards and uh, gameplay elements we've seen before into one neat little package. We have the cannons, we have the rotating axes, the green hooded guys are back, and we also have bombs and the Nazi Gumbies. And the way to avoid these bombs is to either trigger them off screen if you're lucky enough to do so, or try and get close to them as possible. And this is what I mean about the, uh, the ball and chains now being on crack cocaine. And now we come to the most annoying set of jumps in this area, you have to time this perfectly. First of all, jump off this cannonball to get here, and there's actually a cannon over to the right here that will not fire until you trigger it. And you trigger it by jumping over to the right here. Let me just concentrate for a second while I try and get this right. Or not, but you can also just jump in the spikes and take a hit that way. Whatever works, I guess. There's also a green guy there, so you want to kill him before dealing with the cannon fire. You always want to deal with the green guys whenever you see them first as a priority, as your first port of call. 
I just let this bomb explode and cut the last two dollars because I'm getting very close to an extra life. And that's the end of the games room, save for the boss. Oh, and the obviously placed hidden room. And this hidden room is kind of tricky if you don't know what you're doing. You can make all of these jumps and collect all of these dollars. It is kind of tricky though, it's a little easier with the, uh, with the training shoes on. Oh, I nearly cocked it up then. So there you are, you can collect all the money, but that one up, you just can't reach that gap. I'm not even sure you can reach that gap with the training shoes, although I'm sure somebody will prove me wrong. All you've got to do though, again, is jump on the door, through the false ceiling, much like we did in the toy box, and there's your extra life. And now, let's take on our boss, shall we? So our boss this time is officially named the Wacky Scientist. But he's like no scientist I've ever seen. He looks a lot more like a sort of retarded version of the Hamburglar, complete with double chin. Actually, he also looks uh, looks very similar to the Green Hooded dudes that give me so much grief earlier on throughout the level, so maybe he's supposed to be their father or something. And he has quite a simplistic pattern, which you can see here. There's no really need to explain it. Really, the only way you're going to die, like I just did there, is if you risk too much and you jump when the axes are going to hit you. But I've got enough lives, so I could afford to burn a couple here if you really wanted to. Besides, I can now show off his pattern in full. Which, as you can see, isn't much to talk about. He just circles the axes around his head, which again, why is he circling the axes around his head? If he's a scientist, that makes no sense. And then there'll be a, a hole of sorts in the axes, make sure he, that you don't get crushed by him when he comes down to the ceiling, and just attack whenever there's an opening. If you have a full life bar, you can burn a couple of hits. In fact, I'm going to do this just to end the fight. And there you go, he's dead. And we've rescued Pugsley, looking quite dapper in that cape, which he never normally wears. And God damn it, first Wednesday is, is freaking... Uh, First Wednesday, right, doesn't appreciate what you've done for her, and now Pugs is taking a lead. God damn it, boy, go to your room. In fact, you know what, actually, our second force don't go to your room, otherwise you'll find that Gomez has plundered it, and I don't think you'll be happy. So that pretty much completes the game's room then, apart from one more secret area. Press down the pipe that Pugs was standing on, and... we found the Princess's Secret Slide! And there's a lot of money here, enough money to at least replenish one of your hearts. Useful stuff. And if you wanted to, you can go in this pipe as many times as you like until you collect all the money that you've missed the first time round. And it's also kind of fun to hear the uh, You Save the Adams Family music play again on a loop, because that's not a piece of music that's suited to playing for just 10 seconds. <laughs> and so that completes the games room then. There's just one more uh, duty left to perform, and it's in the music room here. Let's see how the addition of Pugsley helps Lurch's musical abilities. Take it away! Still not brilliant by any stretch of the imagination, but it is getting slightly more harmonious. Anyway, that does it for this part of Let's Play The Addams Family. Join me next time when the game gets significantly tougher and I'm going to need quite a few of the lives I've just collected in this video. Until next time then, sayonara.